Miss Lila. <laughs> In a great forest, you will find many huge trees in it. They tower above other trees and appear to be the very picture of strength and maturity. However, loggers will sometimes not even bother to cut down those huge trees. At first glance, uh, one can wonder, why, why not cut them down? Why not you know, uh, get them for the wood. After all, a tree that big size contains twice or three times as much as the lumber as a smaller tree. The reason is very simple. Huge trees are often rotten on the inside. They are hollow trees that children's picture books show that raccoons and other animals to live in. And they are trees that are often blown over in a strong windstorm because while they appear to be a picture of strength, in fact, their hollowness makes them very weak. You know, this is a sense of, and the essence of hypocrisy, appearing strong on the outside, but hollow and rotten on the inside. You know, as we have discussed the time of Second Kings and the Jeroboam the second, and the son of Joasha, right? the northern Israel, even though they were powerful as the kingdom that has previously has come, like the David and um, Solomon restoring the, most of the land during that time, they were hollow and rotten inside. And think about what would God do in that time when people were rotten, when people were not doing well, what do you think God do? You know, God sends prophets. God sends his words to them again and again to remind them of the truth and hoping to bring them to repentance and right relationship with God. You know, so when you see a loss of prophets during a certain period, it's not a good sign. It's a bad sign, right? Because the people are not doing good. So we talked about Elijah. We talked about last week Jonah, right? And this king of Jeroboam II, well, lots of prophets were there, and it tells us that people are not doing well with God. So that's why God is sending them again and again, prophet after prophet, to telling them the truth, to telling them the judgment of God, to tell them the, how God is thinking and God is feeling, and how God is going to deal with them, and ultimately bringing the destruction of northern kingdom and southern Judah as well. Yeah. So prophets come, they bring warning, right? desiring repentance, right? but then people still don't listen. You know, it's so funny because we covered Jonah, and it was the Ninevites where Jonah went to preach, and even just a one sentence, they repented. The whole kingdom repented. But that message was given to the kingdom of northern Israel, but when they read these kind of stories, there is no repentance in their hearts. So my prayer for us this morning is to listen to this as a warning, personally, not as a corporally. I think we can point our fingers to our corporate America or even church as a whole, but not looking as a, a corporally, but uh, looking at personally. Because if you look at corporally, we are dividing the responsibility, but we need to listen as a whole message that is from God. See if there's any similarities that these Israelites, these ungodly characteristics that you see in these Israelites, that we need to repent and bear the fruit of repentance. And this is what God, did, God is disciplining us this morning. You know, this is God's discipline as a loving father. You know, I think God's discipline is one of those characteristics of God that we most neglect. You know, when we uh, talk about God's character, we talk about God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, God's goodness, God's gifts, all these good things, right? But one thing that we forget about is God's discipline, right? So even our earthly parents, they discipline us because they love us, right? But how much more 
that our loving Father will discipline us that we're going to read about Hebrews 12 later on. Right, so I want to share with you how God disciplined the people of Israel and how we may learn the meaning of God's discipline in our lives. So there's, I have two points. Right, I, one point is the truth, the objective moral standard, and judgment. That's a one point. Another point is the hope that God provides in the very end of the ch- uh, book of Amos in chapter 9. There's only nine chapters, but the like, last five verses deals with hope. And all these other eight chapters plus are talking about the truth and judgment. Yeah. So when you look at the map, right? Well, maybe, uh, is it the map? Yeah, when you look at the map, uh, very beginning of Amos, right? Amos is bringing this message, the judgment of around the cities, around the city of, or, or the country of Israel and southern Judah. Uh, so he goes through Damascus, right? Gaza, Tyre, Edom, um, uh, Ammon, Moab, and, and, and later on Judah. And Judah only gets two verses because this is writing to northern Israel. And northern Israel gets from chapter 2, verse 6, through all the way to the end in a way. It was all about them. Right? And, and when we hear these judgments, these people who do not have the word of God, right? you may think, it's so unfair. They didn't have the word of God. How they can, can, they, can they be judged? Right? But then they're being judged as not as specific as the people in Judah and people in Israel. Right? They're being judged as much as they know. So this human decency that God had written in our hearts, like in that kind of thing. So even in contrast of how God judges Judah, who had the word of God, versus uh, people in Moab who did not have the word of God, is very simple. Chapter 2, verse 1, it says, This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath because... He burned as if to line the bones of Edom king. Right? So it's more like a human a decency in how we treat others. I guess they were in a battle and the Edom king was captured. And you know what did they do? They kind of desecrated the, the corpse of the Edom king. You know, showing that kind of respect that they didn't do. Right? And so that's why. But look at the chapter 2, verse 4. And how Judah is being... A judge, right? Says so this is what the Lord says: for three sins of Judah, even for four, right? I will not turn back my wrath because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept His decrees because they have been led astray by false gods and gods their ancestors followed. You see, God is a very just and very fair God. He will not ask for something that you have not been given to. You know, and so that's why the Bible says in the New Testament, much has been given to you and much is required of you. Little is given to you, little is required of you. And so people, you are very smart guys who goes to Cal Poly, right? You know, you're a little bit borderline genius, right? And right, yeah, much is required of you. Yeah. And then you're living in America, right? We're like the top one-third. We get the resource of the top world's one-third that we are responsible for. And much will be required of us in the ways that how we have managed our talents, the truth. You know, even look at the version of Bibles that we have. My goodness, there are about 25 different versions of the Bible that we have. And some of the nations in the world, they don't even have one. Maybe they might have the New Testament, but not the whole Bible. And how many Bibles do you own? Right? How many, even for you, your, your, your smartphone, you have all kinds of resources that we have. Much, much has been given to us, and much, much is required of us, and we are responsible of them. So God is very fair, in fair in judging. So there's not like, oh, I didn't know that. But every culture has some kind of understanding of what they ought to do, but they don't. Every culture has them. So in America, right, I looked it up, and it says, what the four things that we value? Independence, equality. Right? And informality. So we're very casual. Everything is kind of casual. And I think it could be good or it could be bad. And we're kind of direct, right? So even in those kind of independence, 
right? If we infringe upon somebody else's independence, then we get all bent out of shape and stuff, so, right? And so, right? And so that kind of, of what we ought, but we don't factor, right? So every culture has that human decency in the ways that we ought to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, and we don't do that. Right? I mean, I, I remember I told you like last week, the little kids don't like the Ten Commandments because one of the Ten Commandments says, right, do not, die shall not steal. Right? Steal people's stuff. Right? And this, I remember this old, I remember watching a movie and this old, like, you know, teacher is teaching his kids and say, like, why don't you like the commandment? And little kid says, oh, he says something, I forgot, right? You know, then, then the teacher says, like, do you want people to come and take your stuff? And he goes, No. See, you like the commandment. <laughs> Why are you always thinking about taking other people's stuff? Do you want people to come and take your stuff? And they says, no. It's protecting your stuff. You don't want people to come and, so it's a good thing. And he goes like, yeah, I guess it's a good thing. <laughs> right? And it's all part of perspective. You, don't want, you want to take other people's stuff. That's why it's not, you don't like it, but you don't want people to come and take your stuff. Right? Yeah. So p- for the people of Israel... Right, there are severe punishment or, or this judgment that God goes through in this list. Right, it's kind of amazing. Right? So chapter 2, uh, uh, can you get next slide please? Yeah, so verse 6 is talking about the judgment on Israel. Let's just read uh, two verses and I'll kind of go down in the list. And I have about maybe 8 or 9 the list of sins, and so not just to look at them, but really see, like, yeah, do I apply in that? Is God's Spirit talking to me about particularly of that, these kind of things, you know? And so let's just read it. Two verses, let's read it together. Ready? Go. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not command you. Sometimes Bible is very, very, um, you know, it's not even R-rated, you know, it's like a R-plus, you know, like rated, so you got to be very careful, okay, little kids, okay, look down, okay, when, uh, so go home and ask your parents what they need. So, go, go back, and so, this is what I talk about. The first one is that this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Israel, all right, they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sand. So, their priority was all about material gain. Right? So it's a person, even as a needy person, they're worth a pair of sandals, pair of Nikes, I don't know, 100 bucks, right? You know, a little bit of silver, $40 per ounce or whatever it is now, I know. Right? You know, how can you equate a valuable person to some things that cost that you can buy at a shoe store? Right? Or some silver, right? Or a couple ounces of silver or whatever it is. Their value of that, right? It's a material advantage. You know how people have this small value, it's price of a sandal. We're not talking about even Nike, we're talking about, I don't know, something cheaper than Nike, you know? Yeah. They were, t- they were told to be generous and open-handed. Right? Didn't God tell, not them tell them? God told them, be generous. Be nice to foreigners and widows and orphans. Right? Even when you are harvesting, don't go over twice, just go over once so that foreigners and orphans and widows can come and they can make a living in that sense too. The generosity, and that is reflecting God's generosity. So uh, the things that we do is not just reflecting and happening in the vacuum. It reflects our Lord. It reflects my master. It reflects the one who I really love. Right? You know, I told you the husbands, right? When, when there's three cups and your wife mentions something about the middle cup, the value of the middle cup went up astronomically because your my wife mentioned about the middle cup. However good or however bad. You right? Because she talked about the middle cup and the value of that goes up a lot. Right? And so I think sometimes we really need to understand how people are in, in our sinfulness and how we think the things are more valuable than people. And they are connected in some sense. Right. You know, when you see a homeless person, what do you feel? 
Or do you feel nothing? Right? Apathy? Or do you feel at least something, but you don't do anything to about it? But when you do feel something, and you do do something about it, yeah. how, how do you live your life? Yeah. And number two, right? it says they trample on, on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Denying justice. You know, sometimes the system that we have is for the people that who have things, who have and who have the resources to do the right process. And I, I don't know how true this is, but I heard when we were doing a lot of homeless ministry, they're saying that in L.A., there's no place that a homeless person can go because they are not allowed to go within, I don't know how, how, how far, within some distance of a school and park. And so basically, you can't go anywhere. Because, you know, there's parks everywhere. There's through park, well, we have a, a, a Pacheco, right, if this was in L.A., you know what I'm saying? Right? So there's, in neighborhood, when places, there's parks, and there's schools, and elementary schools. They're everywhere. We have like six of them or seven of them in San Luis. Basically, so people from, I met a lot of homeless people from L.A., they say, well, I asked them, so why are you here, you know? You know, hopefully nicely, right? And they say, well, I, you know, we're transient. We're moving to maybe somewhere, but we couldn't live in L.A. because there's school everywhere. There's parks everywhere. Yeah. So this system, right, that we deny their justice. Yeah. So thirdly, look at that. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my, my, my holy name. Right? The, 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 the looseness of that. Right? I'm, I'm going to just, just say it, you know, husband and wife in that sense, right? <laughs> you know, just, when I say husband and wife, it just means that the, the S word, you know, okay? You know? So, so in, in that kind of things, right? It's, it's kind of very sacred thing that God has given us. There's all kinds of stuff in the internet, in our culture, so values, independence, right? right? Casual thing and equality and directness. So it becomes whatever seems right. Whatever and whenever. When you look at how a culture falls from its, in the high days, it always shows the moral decay, especially in this husband and wife area. Yeah. When this becomes very loose, right? And when, when our practices become very loose in this, and we have pornography, homosexuality, adultery before, right? you know, before marriage, and you know, even joking around these kind of subjects, and when you hear all kinds of people who are comedians, right, the topic of sexuality is very rampant, and they think very loosely of it. And even all the TV shows that are on, on garbage, right? And a month later, everybody switched partners already. It's crazy, and we watched that. They, there was English learning program in Korea watching Desperate Housewives. And when I said that in our Korean service one day, and some of them looked down, <laughs> you know, you know, you know and, and because they were practicing that, you know, they were practicing English, watching that kind of TV shows. I never watched this. I'm not sure. Maybe it might not be that bad. I know. Maybe I'm just making assumptions here. Yeah. And joking around those kind of subjects, right? The husband and wife relationship, a very special, intimate relationship, depicting relationship between Christ and church. Right? The concept of this relationship between God and His people that God has given us through this marriage that we take very loosely and doing whatever we feel like doing. Yeah. Right? And, 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 and people think some things are okay. But you know in our hearts how God speaks into our hearts that it is not right. But then when we say, okay, we're acting upon the desire that I am created to have, and they are not okay with that, but if they are created in some kind of, you know, genes or something, and that's okay with them for exercise and to do, that's not okay. There's an absolute standard God has given us in all kinds of sexuality, right? You know, pornography, homosexuality, adultery, you know, premarital sex, Right? Joking around those kind of things, right? It, this cannot be taken very lightly of that. So, so next slide, please. It says, they lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. So what happened was that, you know, let's say you owe me some money, 
And as a collateral, you give me your clothes. And back then, they didn't have a whole closet full of clothes. They only had like maybe one or two. So as a collateral, you get their you know, outer garment. Right? But you were told that you're supposed to give it back before the night is over. Because when they go to sleep, it's going to be cold for them. Right? So they were told to do that, but then they're not practicing these kind of things. They failed to return their garment taken as a collateral for that. So it's financial things. It's about me. It's not about what God has said. It's not about them, right? But it's about me, myself, and I, and in the ways and how I can gain through these things. The law specified about this kind of practice. They cannot, they could not take the garment as a pledge, except for garment, or, or, or they can, but uh, except for a garment of a widow, but they were to return to it on the, to the owner before the nightfall. It says that in Deuteronomy. It says it in the Bible. Yeah. So debt collecting and earning through debts were evil. In the ways that they collected and they practiced these debts, right, they were evil uh-huh. in God's eyes. Uh-huh. And so the God talks about specifically how we ought to handle these kind of things. Uh-huh. But over here in, in, in the fifth one, it says, they drink wine taken as fine. The house of their gods. Right? You see how Jesus, small God, small G, he's talking about idols. Right? He's talking about different gods and they were going there right, to worship. And when you think about that in our generation, what are some other gods that we worship rather than the God of the Bible? Yeah, what, what is it? Yeah, comfort? Maybe money? Right? Maybe fame? Well, stomach, right? Right. Stomach is very important. Meaning not like stomach, stomach, but what you eat. Yeah. And you sometimes then when I look at Facebooks, it's, it's not about God, but it's about food. You know, I'm like wow. You know, again, I have to kind of be careful about what I judge. You know, but then like really, you know, like God knows our hearts, not as an excuse, but as an accuse, even in the ways that yeah, God knows my heart. What is in my heart? And sometimes our hearts are so dark that we don't even know what's inside of our hearts. So we have to ask God, God, what is in my heart? Search my heart, oh God. And reveal to me how dark and how desperate and how defiling and how depraved my heart is. Maybe comfort, maybe security is our God. You know, being safe. They were using the wine they had received as fines. Right? And they were extracting from the poor. And they were just taking from them. Uh, yeah. So the sixth one is, is, is oh no, before please. Yeah, one more, one more, one more. They lie down beside every altar, taking pledge. Okay, so my, but verse 12 says, But you have made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Right. And these Nazarites, Nazarites are the special kinds of people who are very devoted to God. They're very committed to God. And so what they're doing is that people who are very dedicated to God, and they're leading them to compromise, you know? And they're kind of, you, know, um, you know, like luring them to do something evil. Right. You know? And so sometimes that when you think about that, how, what does that mean to us? Right. But then as in church setting, we know our goal is Christ, and you know that God has given us our little ones and our college students and whoever in the ways that we can encourage to make disciples, right? To grow in this loving, kind relationship with God. Right? And, and that maybe we're not doing anything right, outwardly, but how are we being an example for them to follow? Because they do what they see. Right? It's not what we teach in a way, but in a way that how we live our life. So it's more of how are they seeing our lives, our older people. You know, our church is very young. And there's Jack and Marcy and there's me. You know? <laughs> and then there's uh, Jeanette and there's Ella, right? And that's me. Right? And so we are like the, maybe like 3%, like way up there. And, and then there's like a little bit of gap and there's everybody else in that sense. But what kind of things are we showing them? to the little ones, for them to see our lives and say, man, you know what, when I grow up, I want to be just like that person. How they were devoted to God, how they love God, 
how they really lived it out, how they walked the talk, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it is true, sometimes even our parents, how they have discouraged us, right? How they have discouraged our dedication and our devotion to God, even take away and forbid them to be closer to God. You know, I know little ones, even they want to go to a mission trip and stuff like that. And maybe parents do not let them go because of their safety or security or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And sometimes when I think about, like, your kids want to be a doctor, I say, oh, yeah, sure, right on, you know? And they say, man, dad, I want to go to missionary. I want, I want to be a missionary. I want to go to the poor of the poor and go to the Africa and, you know, and your kids say, oh, are you sure about that, you know? I know some of us would love it. Yeah, you know, go ahead and give suffer and die, you know? Yeah, yeah. But some other people are like, no, man, you got such a good, good brain, you know? But you know, in olden days, if you were smart, they said, oh, you should be a pastor. And you were like a little bit less smart, and they said, oh, you should be a doctor. <laughs> yeah. But nowadays, you know, like it's backwards, right? You got nothing to do, like, oh, you be a pastor, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and even tell, they tell us, right? Oh, don't be so crazy about religion. Your relationship with God. Just, just enough of religion is okay. Don't go all in. You got to have a little bit. You have a backup plan, you know? So graduate as an engineer first, right? then go to Bible college or do whatever it is. But you have a backup plan, you know? right? And what, so what are they saying? Yeah, They value the things of the world more than the value things of God. Spending more time at church. I, uh, no, heck no, right? We don't do that. Like, yeah. But, you know, for our church, right, it's an all-day event. Right? It's not just a worship service and go. You know, we go home at 3, and that's, like, early. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You, you, you stick around, and sometimes I see Joshua and Ryan until, like, 4 p.m., like, and in my mind, I kind of go home, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go home, too, you know? <laughs> you know, they're here all the time. Uh, right? And that's a good thing. Right? right? It's a good thing of encouraging one another. Right? Putting fuel to one another to grow and to serve. Right? So what are we you know, doing in our life? What kind of examples are we being? And especially the little ones that we have. Especially if people have a little inkling of they want to be in ministry and they want to be a mission field. What kind of influence are we being? Are we discouraging them? I, I know sometimes the elders have a bad name, right? Because sometimes elders have to make decisions for church that people don't like. And I know a pastor friend who got, who got fired by the different elders. And he goes, man, I hated elders. Right? And one day he was reading the Bible. And he says, man, I don't want to go to heaven either. And I said, well, what happened? And he goes, the Bible says in Revelation there's 24 elders. I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> And the God did changes all later on. Yeah? Yeah. But even here, the second part of it, and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. They hated God's words. That was their sin. You know, God's word is the life that we are sanctified by His word because His word is truth. Right? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of mouth of God. That his words is sweeter than honey. That sustains us. That created the whole world. Can sustain our whole life and bring some kind of reality and sanity and right kind of thinking and right kind of living in our lives. They discourage or stop the prophets from, from, from prophesying. When, you know, when people are not doing well with God, they don't want to hear God's words. They don't want to pray. They don't want to hear God's words preaching. They don't want to come to church. So when I, whenever I meet people and they haven't meant to come to church for a couple weeks, you know, you know, so sometimes I tell them, so what kind of sins are you committing? <laughs> so people are avoiding me, right? I text them and they don't, they don't, you know, they don't, they don't write me back or, you know, in the Facebook, it shows you it has been seen, right? <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, they don't respond, you know, like, okay, you know. Uh, you know, that's how we are. We don't want to come to the light when we are living in darkness. We don't. 
That's the nature of darkness. We keep want to hide away and run away from the light. And this is exactly how Israelites live. All kinds of different responses can come out of a wrong relationship with God, right? From their pride, right? from their running away, and they may start ridiculing people or even church people. Like, again, it's not about church people, it's about me. In the ways of how God is convicting me of my sins as a disciplining me for me to live a correct life and a, a better life that God is leading us to live. You know, we need to humble ourselves and really acknowledge how weak and how limited we are. You know, these Israelites thought they were very powerful people because they, 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 they won over their land. You know? They were very powerful. They were powerful in the eyes of the world. But even in, in, in Amos' life, you know what Amos says? He says, man, this Israelites was so small. And so people's eyes, they were very big, but in God's eyes and Amos' eyes, they were very, very small. So those two visions, that, or three visions that God does give to uh, Moses, uh, Amos, and Amos prays for them, oh, but you know, this, this Israel is so weak and so small. How can they endure? So God gives them the third you know, judgment in that. Right. And so even in, even in America, sometimes it's, it's like America that we trust, not in God that we trust. We have more security in America than in God. I have some funny stories, you know, like about people who live in this kind of faith. And I'm not sure if it was before 9-11, you know, or not. And this pastor, I know, he was supposed to catch a flight, but he realized that he didn't bring his driver license, right? And, and so he got to the airport, but he couldn't, you know, he didn't have time to go back and stuff. But he looked at his glove compartment, and there was an expired year-long pass of your Disneyland pass. He lived in down south in Southern California. So he got into the, um, the gate check-in, right? And he goes, I'm a powerful member of God's kingdom. He thought, he, he, what he was saying about, you know, he's a pastor and stuff like that. And the person looked at it and said, okay, please just let him go. <laughs> you know? Oh, it's amazing. You know, I, I want to try that one day. <laughs> right? Right? And, and that's the thing, man, who do you trust? Do you trust in America? And I think in, in, in human wise, man, America is so powerful. Right? Look at the, all the military might that we have. But in God's eyes, in the prophet's eyes, we may be, oh my goodness, we're so small. Whatever, one thing can really wipe us out. It can. You know? So that's why we need the word. The right? Bible says all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is God. In the beginning was the word. Word was with God. And word was God. And his word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Yeah. We must allow God's word to be preached, allow God's word to be declared, right? And love his words. Run to God. How do you run to God? You run to God's word. That's how we run to God. God is not here in the, in, you know, in the spirit and in the word. When you say you run to God, you're saying that you're running to his words. Yeah. You enjoy in, with his presence, right? Everyday manna is not like you live with yesterday's manna. Yesterday's manna is already rotten. It's gone, except on the Sabbath day, right? But everyday manna, you have to receive from the Word himself. Without this connection with God each day, we will be destroyed. We will perish. Because he, in essence, is the life that we need to connect with. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And here are, you know, some more I'm going to go through. But you know how in each section it talks about here are three or maybe four, right? It's kind of poetic of a way of saying that you have a lot, you know? Because we already counted more than three and more than four, right? It's like saying you, you have a lot, a lot more than this. Yeah. And chapter 8, verse 4, what is it? let's read it together. You will trample the needy and do away with poor of the land. Yeah. 
Yeah, again, it's not just right or oh, apathy, not doing anything about it, but it's very proactive in the things that how God is right calling His church to be the light, to shine His light in these kind of things. Right, very first part of the chapter. 8 verse 4 is talking about getting rid of all the people, all the poor people in a way. Oh, I, I can solve a problem. No problem. Just put them in a truck, right? And ship them onto Alcatraz or something. And our problem is over. Right? And that's what he's saying. We, we, just, we just do away with them. We we'll ship away and just like, you know, get rid of them. It's a very easy way to do. And how evil and how wicked is that in God's eyes? And I think this one will hit home right here, verse 5, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended, that we may market the wheat? Skimping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver. Again, you know, kind of repeating that again. Yeah, this is some, what the commentary said. I'm going to just read to you. I kind of add a little bit more here and there. These oppressors were eager for the monthly festivals and the weekly Sabbaths to end so that they could go back and work cheating their fellow countrymen to make big profits. These holidays were days of rest and worship, but the Israelites, workaholics, did not enjoy them, though they observed them as good religious people. They were eager to engage in their events and doing their activities. They were anxious to enslave the needy in their debt so that they could control them and use them for their own selfish ends. Merchandising, doing business was their priority, not worshiping. Profit, not profit, but profit, right? You know, business profit was their God. And they willingly sacrificed more important things, i.e. worship, connecting with people, serving people uh, who focus on intently on what they will do after worship is over, do not engage in true worship or enter into the spirit of worship. And are we so convicted in this or not? Man, you know, when I preach, I'm all in. You know, when you lead stuff up here, you're all in. But the, when the table is turned, when I'm sitting over there and listening to Donald, then two weeks later, how will I be engaged in Donald's preaching and God speaking through Donald to me? Or will, will I be ima- evaluating Donald? Mm, I'm not sure about this one. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, oh, gosh, man, this is, yeah, this is long, you know? <laughs> this is how people like when I preach, I guess, huh? You know? <laughs> or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Or thinking about like what I need to do after this thing. Yeah. Or are we all in? In this moment of present that God has given us to engage Him, to worship Him, to be all about His masterpiece, that what He has done already through His Son, Jesus Christ, and all these things of this world grow strangely dim in the presence of God. Are we engaging God like that? Ah. Or are we thinking about what we're going to do afterwards? You know, and Jim Simbala says all the time, hey, who gave you an idea the churches where junior and seniors can come, junior and third, and can come and just enjoy for one hour of whatever and go back and do whatever you want to do? That's not worship. Worship is what you do with your life. Right? Monday through Sunday and, and each moment of your life, how you reflect the glory of God who has been revealed to you that you are responsible for the knowledge that God has given to us. And living that out as best as we can with the help of the Holy Spirit. Even in preaching, you know, am I doing it out of love for God and love for the people and loving for people to engage God, to meet God? In any leadership, are we doing it because we love God? Or is it because He pays the bill? Or is it because I like the limelight? Or because I cannot do anything else. What God is addressing the Israelites are so practical in many, many, many ways. You know, why is that? Because God wants us to live a meaningful and fulfilling life. He's a life. He's not about philosophy, something way out there. 
But it's right there where rubber meets the road. In the things that I do, in the ways that I talk to my wife, in the ways that I talk to my kids, in the ways I treat you, in the ways that I say hello to people. In the ways that when I say hello to people, man, I'm like preaching the gospel all over, right? Like, Lord, you know, like whatever you do, it, it reflects out in your relationship with God. That's what God is addressing. God wants our lives to count. It needs to be meaningful. That's why right theology is so important. It's very much more practical theology rather than just some knowledge. You know, this 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century is all about knowledge. Knowledge is not just information, but it's about our connection with God. It's a no, right? Adam knew Eve, and he begot Seth. That intimacy that we know, we experience God, that He's real. He loves me. And things of this world can go bad, but He still loves me. That I'm loved by him. He knows my name. I don't need to be famous. Right? Because he is famous. And I'm just glad that he knows me. And that's all I want. Right? And we live in that reality. And eternal life is not just living long, but it's living with quality. How would, what kind of quality of life that do you live? Right? When, they, when, when the testing comes and all the different dross will just, just rise up and you'll be all wiped away, or is it, we will be, or, or will it be left over this pure silver or pure gold that we live with? And this concept of salvation is not just, you know, I was saved 25 years ago, but I, am sa- I got saved 25 years ago. I am continually being saved in the presence of God, in the power of God, and denying myself and following God. And in the future days when Christ comes back, I will finally be saved from this body and the presence of sin. Yeah. And that's orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy means that right believing and orthopraxy, that leads, right believing will lead to right practice, right living. And, and just because you know something's right, and you know in your head, and you don't live right, that means you don't, you, you're not knowing it. You don't know what that is. It's a very practical, everyday life thing. It's not lofty ideas of philosophy, you know? This right living is so crucial for us and all the judgment, all the things that God is telling Israel is about that. How do you live? How are you treating the poor? How are you treating the aliens? How are you treating your neighbors? How are you treating God? How are you treating the people that who don't cannot right uphold their justice? And so everything is summed up in loving God and loving your neighbors as you love yourself. It's so simple in a way. You know? Yeah. So whatever you do, you think about, hey, did I do that because I love that person? Or did I do that because I just want to express that I'm right? You know? So when I first got married, I'm always right, you know? Right? Because, and you argue with your wife, and man, I want to make the point. And my point is right point. Right? And Francis Chan tells us, you know, that's not wise. <laughs> you, can be, you, can be what, you can be right, you know, and it's not loving, and it's not wise. And it's not loving God and loving, right? And, 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 and everything good from God flows in us and flows through us to the world. In the same way, right? Everything bad from the world and from self can flow in and it can be magnified uh, through the world as well. And God wants to fill this world with good, with himself. And that's why God gave us his command to right, get married and right, have multiplied and all that. Why is that? It's not just getting married. It's about multiplying the image of God. That's the focus. It's not getting married the focus. If you're not ready to do that, don't get married. You're going to create more junk. Right? God is interested in His glory. And why make disciples? It's because we're creating Christ bearers. Same thing with the Old Testament and the New Testament of filling this world with His perfection, His holiness, and His goodness in this world, in making disciples and in multiplying. To finalize everything about the truth and the judgment, look at how God sees their worship. 
you know, chapter 5, verse 21, says, I hate, I despise your religious feast. Think about it, people. What will God say about you? Again, I'm not talking about our church service. I'm talking about you. Your worship to God. In the ways that you highly esteem God. In the ways that you honor Him. I hate, I despise your religious feast. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice following fellowship offerings, I will have no regards to them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your hearts. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. You know, Israel was destroyed some 40 years later by Assyrians in 722 B.C. Southern Judah was uh, uh, destroyed by Babylonians in 586 B.C. Right? We know clearly the wage of sin is death. There's no life in sin. Sin means separation from God, who is the source of life. What would God say about about your worship, your Sunday, your Monday, your Tuesday, even right now. What would God say? What would God say about your life, your relationships, your relationship with your spouse, your kids, your brothers and sisters, your real brothers and sisters, and, and your brothers and sisters in Christ? Hmm. I think we should really sit here a little bit and allow His Spirit to convict our hearts. If there's anything in our lives that is not of God, we need to allow God to burn it off, God, cleanse it with His precious blood, and overwhelm us with your love. You know, Matt Redman said, it's not about the song, it's not about the sermon, it's not about the offering, it's not about the building, it's, it's not about ourselves even. It's about God. It's about Him. Who He is and what He has done. He is the Creator. He is the Redeemer. He is the Lord Almighty. He is God who is worthy of all. We come to Him in reverence and ultimate concern for Him and of Him. And He will speak to us and be part of His movement for His purpose of bringing maximum glory to Him. Are we so mesmerized about Him that only thing you want to be revealed and to express and to fill this world is Him and nothing else? And until we sit with Him in His presence where His glory so overly overwhelm us that you look at the masterpiece that He has already painted in the life of Jesus Christ, right? we're so overwhelmed with the fact right? where we are forever changed by the news of the Jesus Christ. We're nothing that we want more than to fill our lives with that truth and fill this world and fill our church and fill our families and fill our schools with that. Amen. We really need it. This world does not need money. This world does not need more talents. This world does not need more America Got Talent and stuff like that. No, this world needs God. And we are that agent, that missionary, who can bring God in those places, including those dark places. Man, I think we are totally deflated to seeing the list after list of list of list of seeing, man, that's me. That's me, how I honor Sundays. That's me, how I honor my quiet time. I mean, my pajamas, you know. You know, or, you know, I'm not saying don't do that, but you know what I'm saying? The attitude that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Defeated, discouraged, and, you know, damned by the truth of God and His standard. It's absolute standard. But you know what? It doesn't end there. God hopes 
God gives us hope. There's a godly hope. You know, we come to a point, my goodness, I cannot do this. But Christ can. Amen? Amen. I know I cannot, but Christ can. That's why Christ in me is the hope of the glory. Right? I know I cannot do this. I know I cannot be a good pastor. I cannot be a good friend. I cannot be a good husband, a good father. But Christ can. He can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's why he gives us that hope. He gives the promise or I will restore the house of David. And yes, in little sense in the history, but ultimately in the life of Christ, in his kingdom, right? That will have a lasting kingdom that God is promising to restore the house of David. The God's message is always hopeful because God is love. God is love, y'all. Right? God loves so much, and that is our living hope, new life, new birth, right? Under the new lordship. It's under the new management. You know, I'm not yet yesterday. He's a new person today. Whoever is in Christ, he's a new creation. We're under a new management each day. For God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He proved to us how much he loves us. Right? Even his disciplines are there because he loves us. And I know some of you, right? You don't like being disciplined. When I say something about, I'm a very, very gentle person. You know that, right? And if I had the, you know, the truth and grace, right? Let's say this is the middle, right? Truth and grace. I probably fall like over here. And I know some of you guys fall on this side over here. You know who you are, right? Right, right, you know, right? But then Jesus came full of truth and full of grace. And that's our goal. And I want to grow in that. Right? But I know sometimes when we are rebuked or when I rebuke, man, it's game over. You don't want to hear any rebuke. Just imagine how you're going to live your life. It's like a driving. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. You know, somebody tell you, hey, you're going the wrong way. You're like, what? 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 You're going to die. Oh. I'm going to read Hebrew chapter 12. And yet, and, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement. Oh, oh that's actually a different version. Can you uh, slide? One more, please. One more. Is that it? One more. <laughs> okay, that's it, huh? One more. Oh, yeah, yes. Got it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Let's read it together. Ready? Go. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he receives. It is for discipline that you have been endured. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are a living children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of the spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed as to yeah, peaceful fruit of righteousness. Yeah, we want that. We want God to show up. I'm hoping that you feel rebuked today through listening of all the sins. And his amazing love and amazing hope that he has for us, that he disciplines us. His love provides us teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training for us to live this eternal life, this abundant life, this quality life, like Jesus Christ lived. We know we cannot, but we know Christ can do that in our life. He is the example He's not just the beginning. He's the author and perfecter. And when he, we say he's the author, he has authority over all. He is the word in the beginning and came in flesh and made this world richly. 
right? This word richly dwell in our lives to come out in flesh, to live that out by the Spirit of God. Christ in us it is the living hope. He, being the Lord, is the best. That He is the Lord of the dead and of the living. Listen to Him and follow Him. And it's good to be rebuked by Him. And we need to be rebuked. We need to be corrected each day in the ways that we can bear the fruit of righteousness in our lives. And that's my hope for you. And as you go to the little groups today, I share with one another how you feel convicted, how you feel rebuked, how you feel disciplined and be corrected in order for us to bear the fruit of righteousness. Amen? That's all rise. Father God, we thank you so much for our time together. We thank you for your teaching us through this prophet Amos. Father, when we read through these sins, this is not the sin of these people who lived 3,000 years ago. There's nothing new under the sun, and it reveals something about us. And your Spirit, who uses these words to convict our hearts, wanting repentance, wanting to bear the full repentance, we thank you so much for you allowing us to experience that. Father, you love us. You want us to have and live the abundant life. And the sin gets in our way. This sin distracts us. Sin steals this true meaning of life that you want to give us. It separates us from the life itself. Father, we repent this morning, we lay down our lives before you. And we sit here, we stand here in the presence of Almighty God who have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And we see that glory that what you have done through your Son, Jesus Christ, and that truth of your love and your act overwhelms us. And we want to be changed by the fact of the gospel. And we pray that it is your goodness that brings us repentance, knowing that you have the best interest of us, that you can lead us our lives, and you can be the Lord, best Lord of our lives. We want that to happen in our lives, Father God. So do it for your glory. Fill this world, fill our church, fill our families with your glory, with your holiness with your perfection, that we want to be the conduit of your holiness, Father God. Take us, Lord. Use us mightily. Do it in the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And in Jesus Christ, let me pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Sunday.